Time to go. Okay, this session, uh, session number six, uh, is uh, anti-Semitism recorded and predicted in the Bible. So I want to look at uh, examples of that here, and, and how would we uh, look at that? So how do you judge whether anti-Semitism is recorded or predicted in the Bible? Remember, we talked earlier about uh, some Jewish writings have actually, you know, modern Jewish writings have tried to list all events in history that are anti-Semitic, and they take all the battles where the Israelites were attacked by others, and they include that as part of their package of anti-Semitism. And uh, I'm not willing to go there. And I'm, I'm going to start with Nehemiah 4. So if you can find Nehemiah. We won't stay there very long, but uh, Nehemiah 4. You remember the story. Verse 1. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Here, O our God, how we are despised. We turn their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forget their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before thee. So, Samballot and the, the people of Samaria who, who opposed Israel, really the Israelites, building up Jerusalem and building a wall and uh, kind of rebuilding their nation. Is that anti-Semitic? What do you think? Is it dead center? Is it questionable? Borderline. I mean, is all mocking kind of racist? Uh, I think that it was more an affront to their current power that they had, whether it was the Jews rebuilding that or not, it was kind of irrelevant to them. It was going to cut into profit margin of being people in charge. Yeah, I, I think this is more political opposition than anti-Semitic opposition. Although you have to admit they use rather strong language. Uh, but human beings tend to do that sometimes in criticizing each other. Uh, so here, uh, I tend to see it just as political. They're opposing the Jews and they're doing, and they're, they're, uh, I think they're using the language like that to jack themselves up, perhaps, relative to the Jewish people, or and even to intimidate the Jewish people, you know, Nehemiah and others. Uh, but I'm not sure that they're opposing them simply because they're Jews, or any of those reasons that we had before. Uh, I think it's just geopolitical concerns uh, about their stat, their own status there in the in the Middle East. And they're not, there doesn't seem to be any attempt to kill all the Jews. They just don't want the city to be rebuilt, and they don't have walled around, and they want to have easy access, and if they ever want to come over and plunder, they want to do that, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, so I'm not sure I see it as anti-Semitic in the same way as we're going to see in the couple of uh, other passages that we're going to look at. And we're actually going to look at four passages, three main sections. Two of them go together. We're going to deal with the book of Esther, which we've already alluded to. And then I'm going to deal with a forgotten passage, and that's Joel 3. 
If you go to Matthew 24 and 25, we have the Olivet Discourse, and in Matthew 25, Jesus teaches the judgment of the nations. What a lot of people fail to see is that Jesus is partially giving his comment on Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 teaches the judgment of the nations. In fact, it is the main teaching in the Bible on the judgment of the nations, and Jesus just gives a little summary of things as part of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, it helps us to know the timing and all that. And then we're going to deal with Revelation 12 at the end and reinforce what we saw in the last uh, paper of satanic opposition to Israel. So, let's get into the story of Esther, Mordecai, and Haman. The story of the ancient Hitler. So, let's find Esther. Esther, chapter 3. We'll begin in verse number 1. The, uh, we're going to just kind of walk through the passage, kind of a running commentary. And I have um, my notes here for you. Uh, again, back to uh, looking at things. The king promotes Haman to a supreme position there in verse 1. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. Now, is there significance to the fact that Haman is called an Agagite? Haman could be a literal descendant of the Amalekites. Remember King Agag? 1 Samuel 15? Agag could be a dynastic title like Pharaoh, so it could be kind of like... A, uh, leader, uh, leadership title. So he's, uh, but could it also be, and some scholars think this, that it could be a nickname quality standing for the enemies of the Hebrews at that point in history. Now, either way you go on this, it ain't good to use scholarly language. Okay. Uh, the king promotes Haman to a supreme position and his position he uses to be an enemy to Israel. Now the king's servants were to bow down and pay homage to him in verse 2 and all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down, paid homage to Haman for so the king had commanded concerning him but Mordecai did not. Just a simple fact that Mordecai would not pay such homage. Now isn't that normal for a Jewish person? Remember the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? Wouldn't bow down at the statue. So it's normal for Christians and later, uh, Jews and later Christians not to bow down to these false, uh, false guys who are being worshipped. And so he wouldn't bow down, only bow down to God. Kind of idea. And the other servants quiz Mordecai and discover he would not bow down because he was a Jew. Verses 3 and 4. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him and he would not listen to them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So the servants quiz Mordecai and report it back, apparently report it back to Haman. Um, and Haman's response, you know, they were wondering, will it stand? Will he allow that? You know, it would be a religious exemption, perhaps. Would he allow it? And of course, you know, the response is pretty strong. He has an anger response, verse 5. It says, when he, he saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. So not just the outward thing, but the respect thing. Uh, he was angry, filled with rage. And notice, here's the key that I think that pushes it into anti-Semitism. He blames all Jewish people. In verse 6, 
But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, that is the Persian kingdom, the Persian empire. So we're going to kill every Jew in the empire because one Jew did not bow down to me. Now he's assuming that none of the other Jews would either uh, if they're religious like Mordecai. But this is a pretty strong response. Genocide because I was not obeyed or, or paid homage to. So... Is Haman's anti-Semitic action here religious anti-Semitism or ethnic anti-Semitism? I think it's both. Okay, so your answer is yes. <laughs> it's both. I think you're right. I think it's both. There's obviously the religious convictions of... Uh, Mordecai that keep him from bowing down uh, and there's a response of Haman to that but then the fact that he just wants to plaster all the Jewish people there seems to be an ethnic part to that because let's face it there's going to be some of those Jews some of those Jewish people in the Persian Empire who are not very religious whether he understands that or not I don't know but uh, there is I think an ethnic side to this question as it develops Maybe initially it's not that, but as it develops, it is. So what happens next? Uh, Haman convinces the king to allow the destruction of the Jews for two reasons. Now, Haman himself did not have the authority to kill all the Jews. That only had to come from the king, so he's got to go do something. And number one, he accuses them of they're different. That is, as to their laws, I think is the point. If you come down, verse 8, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people. And they do not observe the king's laws. Now, I'm not sure that's true, but he's saying it. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Okay, well, then just kick them out of the empire. Is that where he's going? No. He's going to genocide. Okay. So they're different in terms of the laws, and they do not assimilate. They don't observe his, the, the king's ways. They, they're not part of our life. So they refuse to assimilate. So Haman's plan is not simply to ban Jews from the empire. His plan is to utterly destroy or kill all the Jews, just like Hitler did over two millennia later. Look at verse 13. And letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. Now, I've not done the calculation how many days advance warning they had, but it's interesting. The Persians were very schedule-oriented. So they give them warning. Now, I have no idea. We would have anything in the text that tells us why the king did that. Um, but they have a warning. And it's in, that, it's in that interim from the time they make the proclamation until the actual time when the the people are allowed to attack the Jews, that we have the story of Esther rising up and delivering uh, the Jews and having Haman end up killed. Okay, It's a very beautiful story, of course. But here, he's, he wants to utterly destroy or kill all the Jews. That's genocide. And so that is clearly anti-Semitism. And I think it's the first occurrence in the Bible of true anti-Semitic tendencies. Earlier battles, back and forth, people, I, I see more as just geopolitical wrangling that's common to the human race, and I don't see it as anti-Semitic. But here, I don't think you can get around it. 
Now we come to Joel 3 and Matthew 25. Both passages teach the restoration of Israel and the judgment of the nations. In the end times. Matthew 25 is partly Jesus' commentary on Joel 3. So let's begin in Joel 3, which is the less familiar passage. I assume all of you have probably read Joel 3. Um, but let's look at it. The time of the passage is the restoration of Israel. It says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. See, he's not going to destroy them. God's not going to destroy them. And this is, he just talked about the great and awesome day of the Lord in 231. Now, in verse 2, we have the main point of the chapter is the judgment of the nations for how they have treated Israel and the Jewish people. And let's read 2 through 8 together. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? It's in Israel. Okay, that's a good guess. <laughs> where in Israel? Not Megiddo, no. Is it the same as like the Kidron Valley? It is, exact good. You get a star for today. It's the same as the Kidron Valley? Now, where's the Kidron Valley? Okay, it is the valley between the Mount of Olives on the east and the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Okay, so uh, that's the valley of Jehoshaphat. When you go there, You've seen some of the pictures. There are just tons of uh, tombstones, buried people there. It's a giant cemetery. Jews and Muslims and others. There's the belief that that's going to be where the judgment occurs. And there is a judgment there when the Lord comes back. It's the judgment of the nations. Okay. Uh, he says, I'll gather all the nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there. Um, notice the way it is. Judgment with them there. On behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel. So this judgment of the nations is in regard to Israel. That's missed. I'm looking at verse 2. So my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Moreover, what are you to me, O Tyre, Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you rendering me a recompense? But if you do recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense on your head. Since you have taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, in order to remove them far from their territory. Behold, I am going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. And also I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. In other words, I'm going to turn everything on its head. You have hurt my people, Israel. I'm going to hurt you, God says. It's a judgment. Then you look at verse 19. He gives a specific example later in the chapter. Egypt will become a waste, and Edom will become a desolate wilderness. Remember, one of the things that Edom did that was a nasty sin was it helped the Babylonians when the Babylonians came in to take Judah. Edom participated and helped. Of course, part of that was so that Babylon, Babylon would spare them uh, kind of thing but he, he judges them 
and because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. So he actually names some examples here. And the judgment on the nations is certain. God is angry with them. Verses 9 to 13. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't it go the other way? You know, you're supposed to beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. And it is said that way a couple times the other way. Here it's, no, go to war. Judgment imagery. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, thy mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is come. Tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. See, if you're going to give a Bible lesson in church on the judgment of the nations, start here and not in Matthew 25. A lot more detail here. And then God will protect, preserve, and forgive his people Israel. If you look at 14 through 18, he says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. And the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Notice he's not roaring from Beijing or Washington, D.C. or London. He's roaring from where? Zion or Jerusalem. His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth tremble, but the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. And it will come about in that day that the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water and the spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. So God will protect, preserve, and forgive his people. And then the last two verses of the chapter, but Judah will be inhabited forever in Jerusalem for all generations. Judah will be inhabited how long? Not just a thousand years? That's interesting. Sometimes we talk as if the millennium, the thousand years, fulfills all the promises. And my response is, how can a thousand years fulfill a forever promise? No, the thousand years is just the beginning of the fulfillment. It's the kickoff party for God's forever kingdom. Kind of keep that in mind. The way you talk about it says, God says, I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So the nations are going to be brought back. You have the day of the Lord judgments and the end of that second coming. But when he comes back, he's going to gather the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat, there before Jerusalem, before Mount Zion, and he's going to judge the nations. Now, does the end-time judgment of the nations imply anti-Semitic attitudes on the part of some people among the nations? You know, all these nations have mistreated Israel. Are they being anti-Semitic in doing that? What do you think? This is an opinion question. It's not a pop quiz where you flunk if you give the wrong answer. Okay, and the reason you know you're right is that this is a judgment. Jesus is going to make that announcement as to the determination. He already knows who, who does what. So, but there's, a, there's going to line up the nations, remember? And that's why, why Matthew 25 is very helpful. If you go over to Matthew 25...
Verse 31, Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. So he's telling us that among the nations, some were good, some were not. And what's the issue? Just general righteousness? No. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in naked. You clothed me, I was sick. You visited me, I was in prison. You came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in, etc.? His answer was, truly I say to you, verse 40, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did it to me. Now who is he pointing to when he says brothers? So you've got sheep and goats. And now you have a third group, brothers. I think he's talking about the Jews. This is, goes back to Joel chapter 3. Got to keep that in mind. Dave, you had a comment? Yeah, um, Dr. Tom Walter quoted this towards Lance, but it was done years ago. And he used this, he thought he had fun with George Lance. Lance was human over this, what, based on this judgment. Hmm. Well, Lance, I think, has changed his mind by now. Like, like Sproul, he's now a female preacher. Yep. So, uh, so Jesus adds to that. He, he helps us understand. Okay, the nations are brought, but some of them did not mistreat Israel. Others did. And so he's, he's going to divide that based upon that. There'll be certain nations, I think, politically enter the kingdom, and others will not. Then he goes on to individualize it a little. You know, there's one more thing, and if you think about it, because uh, brought this up many times, if they go to the tribulation or the day of the Lord, and then the judgment, so there's several judgments prior to the kingdom, and this is a major, to think that these people all made it through the tribulation, and then they're being judged again, Based on their treatment of the Jews, which is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it's not good to be in their camp, I guess. Uh, on the wrong end of that uh, particular stick. But, um, but, all, but you were right. Not everybody is in the bad cart on that among the nations. And Jesus clarifies that. He gives, he gives kind of a comment on Joel chapter 3. Okay. All right. Now we move to Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> we have the identification of the woman. Look in verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with a child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. In verse 5, she gives birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now, why is the Roman Catholic view uh, wrong that says that uh, this is the Virgin Mary? I love computers. You can fix typos on the fly. Why is it wrong? Well, now, first off, the woman is a sign. Verse 1. That's what she's called. She's called a sign. That's a hint that she is not a real woman. Now, why is the view that the woman is the church wrong? There are many covenant guys, for example, who hold that it's the church. There are others who hold that it's the church. There are some who say... It could be the church, it could be Israel. But why is the view that the woman is the church wrong? Well, Christ gives birth to the church, not the other way around. In verse 5, this woman gives birth to Jesus. So it can't be the church because Jesus gives birth to the church. The woman is the nation Israel.
the nation Israel gives birth to the Christ child in history. And the image of the sun, moon, and stars has already been defined for us in Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Do you remember that passage? Joseph and his dreams. And I always thought that Joseph was a little bit arrogant in telling his brothers his dreams. Remember that? And he has this dream uh, that there are 12 stars. 11 stars are his brothers, and he's the big 12 star, you know, and his father's the, the sun, his mother's the moon, and they're all going to bow down to him in that dream. And of course, God was giving a predictive dream to Joseph. Now, the rest of them did not know that. In fact, his father questioned him and didn't like it. And of course, his brothers were worse. You know, they feigned his death and sold him into slavery, and we know how the story goes on. So that image is already there, so why not use it? You know, an interpretation, all these uh, interpreters, and they they don't don't want to touch that. It's already there. It's defined for us already. So uh, she's a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. That's, That's the 12 sons of Israel. So this is talking about Israel the family of Jacob. The nation flees into the wilderness during the tribulation period in verse 6, where she's nourished for 1260 days. I take that literally. I think that's the last half of the trib. The child, the identification of the child is Jesus, the Messiah in verse 5. He's a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And then it says he was caught up. He'll rule the nations with a rod of iron. Compare that to Isaiah 11. He's caught up to God in his throne. I think that refers to the ascension. So it gives a little history there of that. And the blood of this Messiah is the basis for salvation. Come down to verse 11. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, but because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. So we see this child as the same as the lamb that's mentioned in verse 11 and throughout the book of Revelation. That's pretty easy to make that connection since he is the one who will rule the nations. Identification of the dragon. The dragon is announced and described in verse 3. He's also a sign. Another sign appeared in heaven. A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. That's, that relates to Daniel. and relates later in the book of Revelation to Babylon. The dragon is identified clearly in verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So you have the dragon, the serpent, the devil, the Satan. Those are all terms, tags, for the same same personage, the adversary, the opposer, the enemy. Any questions at this point? (coughs) So, serpent of old, all these four. Deeds of Satan, his original falls in verse 4. It says his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. And I think this is just a summary of who the dragon is. Going back in time, uh, back, back in the days of Genesis, his original fall, he drew away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And verse 4, when it says... He stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And I think we see that played out in Bethlehem and Herod trying to kill the baby boys and and did kill the baby boys two and under, if you remember. But then we have the later fall of Satan in the middle of the tribulation. You see, right now, Satan still has access to the Father in heaven. Isn't that correct? In Job, he goes to heaven, talks to God. 
He still has access, although he doesn't live there anymore. He lives on earth. Okay. He's not shoveling coal in hell, by the way. He lives on the earth. Okay. Uh, but he's going to be cast out, so he no longer has access to even talk to the Father. And I think in 7 through 10, that's what's here. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Uh, and the accuser of the brethren, verse 10, has been thrown down, who accuses them before our God day and day night notice Satan's anger response just like Haman had an anger response notice the anger response here verse 13 and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child so he persecutes Israel is it blind rage? Is it anti-Semitic? Verse 14 tells us that uh, God supernaturally protects this woman, Israel, during the last three and a half years of the trip. Remember that coincides with Antichrist turning on them halfway through. And then we have... Uh, Protection, the serpent, the serpent continues to go after him, verse 15. Uh, pours water to try to kill her away with a flood, but the earth helped the woman, the earth opened up. And so what do you see are these supernatural events where God is protecting Israel. And in verse 17, Satan is enraged with the woman. He ought to be enraged at God, and he probably is, but the text says he's enraged with the woman and he seeks to kill other Jews and I think here Messianic Jews the ones who know the Lord now is this anti-Semitic it seems to be uh, and the second question is Satan behind anti-Semitism in history and in the world today does this, is this enough? Now, one key in this text is that it goes back to the history of Satan from the beginning. And tries to, it kind of gives us, this is the package of who Satan is. And so that kind of helps us maybe think, yeah, that the entire history of things, and not just in the trib, but there's this anti-Semitic attitude on the part of Satan, that he hates the Jewish people. And sometimes I say it this way, Satan hates what God loves. Okay. So he hates the Jewish people because they are God's chosen earthly people. And he hates the church. First Peter 5, 8, he's walking around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour among us. So he hates the church. So, I think this is indeed anti-Semitism. Genesis 12, 3, how many times have we said this? It's still in the Bible. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Ask Haman, Hitler, Stalin, and Saddam Hussein if this verse is true. And there's no place for racist, anti-Semitic attitudes among Bible-believing Christians. But the Bible is honest, and it tells us in history there has been, and in history there will be further persecution, anti-Semitic persecution of the Jewish people. Okay, any questions about that? Yes, sir. My question is, it relates to Ezekiel 5 and 6. Um, it were taught, Ezekiel is told to divide a cut hair, divide your hair, and then in Ezekiel 6, God says that he's bringing this judgment um, on Jerusalem, and that they're going to be driven throughout the nations and whatnot. Uh, is it possible in some kind of way that 
people can, or Satan is using things like that as Satan is God and he's he's doing God's work by persecuting the Jews under the guise of prophecies like Ezekiel five and six. Well, let me think. Let me meander around and see if I understand you. Okay, uh, Satan is the unwilling servant of Jehovah. Okay, so God is orchestrating the plan, but just like with Habakkuk, remember Habakkuk, I think we mentioned this maybe last night, Habakkuk, first few verses, uh, he's complaining about how wicked his nation is, and God says, don't worry, I'm raising up the Chaldeans to come and stomp your country. That wasn't the answer he wanted from God, right? And he went, then he goes on in the first chapter, wait a minute, God, you got this backwards. You're judging the wrong people. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. You got them backwards. Uh, and then, you know, in chapter two, finally God says, no, you gotta trust me on this. I will one day judge them. But right now I'm using them to judge you. Now from Satan's point of view, he's energizing the Babylonians probably for sure. Because he hates the Jews. But God is, or God is putting structure to the evil choices of men. That's the way I like to say it. I don't think God causes evil. I think he puts structure to the evil choices of men uh, so that everything works out together for good to those who love him. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the way I view that. So I don't know if I came in on your question, but I, I think Satan is doing things, but God is using Satan, and Satan doesn't always know it. In fact, most of the time he doesn't know it, probably. He's, he probably, I think, thinks he's the king of the hill, like you were suggesting. But he's not. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, not so much a question, but going back to what he was saying, uh, and the way you answered that, you can see that happen all the time, you know, where God uses these other nations and everything to chastise Israel, but then he turns around and gives it back to them, you know? Uh, yeah. Funny principle how he does that. Yeah. Well, he, he, you know, and he used uh, the wicked white Europeans to judge the Native Americans in the North American continent. They were, you know, I'm going to write a book all these days if I ever have lived to be 150 on the myth of the peaceful Native Americans. Some of them were, just like some others, people groups, they have. We have our peaceful people and we have our warlike people. And there were a lot of warlike Native Americans. And God used the Europeans to judge them for a lot of reasons. But, uh, and God does that. He raises up. He, but those people get judged too. Everybody gets judged in the end. And, you know, when you think about that, there's a lot of moving pieces to that. And I'm not smart enough to figure that out. Only an infinite being can do that. So, you know, this is part of the greatness of God. Okay, any other questions or comments? It is uh, time for lunch. So we'll take a lunch break and we'll still be back, what, at one o'clock? Yeah, I think uh, one, it gives about, about a little over an hour. Okay.